Well, again, 122 in part 4 of chapter 22, we'll talk about some of the Meiji period industrialization and the economics of the late 19th century. And with the end of the daimyo domains, the government needed a new system of land ownership that would transform a rural population from indentured serfs into citizens. And to do so, it enacted a land reform program that redefined the domain lands as private property of the tillers while compensating the previous owners with government bonds. A new land tax set at an annual rate of 3% of the land's estimated value was then imposed to raise revenue for the government. And this tax is key. It proved to be a lucrative source of income for the government. And they will use this to build on an industrial economy which had already been building at the end of the Tokugawa period. And they will use these tax revenues to provide a massive stimulus in the form of financial subsidies, training, foreign advisors, improved transport and communications, and most of all, a universal education system emphasizing applied science. This is not what China did. China relies very little on foreign capital to do anything because they have these tax revenues. But it is not going to be easy on the population. The workers are going to suffer. And many of those who tilled those now private pieces of land, if there is a bad crop and they don't have money to pay those taxes, eventually their wealthier neighbors are going to buy them out. And that's going to result in a huge landed gentry again. And many of them then will escape to the city seeking employment. And that's going to provide this industrial sector with all kinds of cheap labor. And these are some of the areas that they are big in. Weaponry, tea, silk, shipbuilding, and sake, which is fermented rice wine for those of you that don't know. And from the start, a distinctive feature of the Meiji model was the intimate relationship between government and private business. This isn't unfettered laissez-faire capitalism. This is guided capitalism from the top down. And once an individual enterprise or industry was on its feet, it was turned over entirely to private ownership. And as I mentioned, from a worker's perspective, the Meiji reforms had a less attractive size. This growth was subsidized by funds provided by the new land tax, but the tax imposed severe hardships on the peasants, many of whom fled to the cities again, and they provided an abundant source of cheap labor. The Meiji reformers destroyed much of the traditional social system. With the abolition of hereditary rights in 1871, the legal restrictions of the past were brought to an end with a single stroke. Special privileges for the aristocracy were abolished, as were the legal restrictions on the ETA, or the traditional slave class, which numbered about 400,000 people in the 1870s. Another key focus of the reformers was the army. And again, we mentioned this in part three, the Satcho, or the Satsumu, and Choso reformers had been struck by the West and their advanced military equipment. And so, the old feudal army, based on the traditional samurai warrior class, was abolished, and an imperial army based on universal conscription, or the draft, was formed in 1871. Education also underwent major, major changes. The Meiji leaders adopted the American model of the three-tiered system, culminating in a series of universities and specialized institutes. They also sent bright students to study abroad, and one of Theodore Roosevelt's classmates at Harvard was a Japanese man who ends up becoming prominent in the military. And they brought foreign scholars to Japan to teach in the new schools, where much of the content was inspired by Western models. In another break with tradition, women for the first time, were given an opportunity to get an education. By the end of the century, however, changes were underway 
as women began to play a crucial role in the nation's effort to modernize. Urged by their parents to augment family income, as well as by the government to fulfill their patriotic duty, young girls went en masse to work in textile mills. And from 1894 through 1912, women represented 60% of the Japanese labor force. Women helped to modernize Japanese industry. That's amazing. Thanks to them, by 1914, Japan was the world's leading exporter of silk and dominated cotton manufacturing. Without the revenues earned from textile exports, Japan might have had to require an infusion of foreign capital to develop its heavy industry and military, which will go on in leaps and bounds in the 1920s and 30s. Japanese women received few rewards for their contribution, however, and in 1900, new regulations prohibiting women from joining political organizations or attending public meetings was passed. Within the family, it's still a male-dominated patriarchal structure. But, as just mentioned, out in society, there are more opportunities now for Japanese women. And beginning in 1905, a group of independent-minded women petitioned the Japanese parliament or the Diet to rescind this restriction on being involved in political activities. Although the regulation was not repealed until 1922, calls for women's rights increasingly were heard. And on page 588 in the seventh edition, this is really brought out in full if you are interested in reading more on this particular topic. So now you have some of the foundations of the Industrial Revolution in Japan.